Good morning. Good morning, everyone, to all our viewers, all our listeners in cyberspace. Um, welcome, special welcome. Uh, bienvenido, bienvenida um, to our fourth, what is our fourth Salesis Forum under the leadership of Acting Director, Dr. Godfrey St. Bernard. In this forum, we examine a very um, important um, topic, which has gained more currency and more focus, um, particularly during the period of COVID-19. And this topic looks at international migration and emerging subpopulations and human rights in Trinidad and Tobago as well. Um, and I am Roy McCree, as you have already been told, and I would be your chair um, for this morning's um, discussions on this important topic. Let me hand you over now to Acting Director Godfrey St. Bernard to offer his welcoming remarks. Dr. St. Bernard. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen in the virtual audience in cyberspace. We at Salesis are very delighted to have you. And also I want to issue special greetings to our distinguished panel that will present to you during this very special session. I also want to welcome each and every one of you to the University of the West Indies. And indeed, it is always a pleasure for Salesis. And when I say Salesis, I'm also including our colleagues in Barbados and in Jamaica. It is always a pleasure for us to host these events. And so far, we have successfully hosted three such events, the first one back in November, looking at the national budget and its implications for development prospects in Trinidad and Tobago. And the last two focus specifically on the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the education system in Trinidad and Tobago. It was so extensive, we had to have uh, two forums. So today we are focusing on international migration, emerging subpopulations, and human rights in Trinidad and Tobago, maximizing benefits, minimizing threats to national development. So we are, as a, as a, as a development studies institute, Salesis is really ensuring that all of these forums at some point in time, tie into the issue of national development. So that being the case, um, we have given long and hard consideration to you know, how we would structure this um, forum. And I have to admit that I am really heartened by the generosity and hard work and commitment of the staff here in Salesis. We are well-oiled engine in terms of making these events happen. So migration is an event, it is a social event because it involves human populations. And migration is an event that is largely economically determined, right? Migration, the source of migration is really economic determinism. And human beings have to live, human beings have to secure their own material well being. And when you think of the history of humankind, I think migration has been a staple, a standard form that facilitates you know, activities and individuals' attempts to feed themselves and avail themselves of what is necessary to sustain life and limb. And Migration in this era has become even more important, if only because of demographic events and demographic factors such as fertility and mortality. Almost everywhere in the world, and certainly in the Caribbean, fertility has been declining across time. 
and several Caribbean countries are already at a point where fertility is below replacement level. At the same time, Caribbean countries have become among those countries with the fastest pace of aging populations. And aging populations, because generally people are living longer, and there's a strong correlation between the fact that people are living longer and the number of deaths that occur in countries annually. In fact, as people live longer, what you will find is the number of deaths that occur in countries annually increasing. And that sounds sort of contradictory, but what really is happening is you have so many older people in your population, and because you have so many older, so many more older people in your population, relatively speaking, they eventually die. And older people are much more likely to die. So that is responsible for the increase. And what that is saying is that the, the population growth due to the difference in births and deaths annually is actually um, decreasing. And that is contributing to a slowing down of population growth in many countries to the point that, you know, countries when they think of their population policies will have no choice but to rely on migration and international migration as the lever to facilitate population growth to a level that would sustain populations and fulfill their development agendas. So with that in mind, I think, you know, um, international migration becomes an important issue for us to embrace. And it is important because it involves international migration is two-way traffic. We have immigrants and we have emigrants. And when we look at the breadth of the panel that we have here this morning, clearly the panelists will be dealing with issues that impact both immigrants and emigrants. Quite apart from the economic dimension associated with international migration and the movements that take place, these movements are also associated with a host of human rights issues, human rights for native populations and human rights for immigrant populations are shrouded in, in international conventions. So I, we think, you know, at Salises, we think that this is a very important issue for us to have our friends and colleagues and associates assist us in discussing and we have hosted a forum such as this one this morning to um, enlighten our audience and others as to you know the issues that matter. So having said that, I think you know I have um, made my introductory remarks and I'm very happy to um, announce that we can forge ahead and begin the proceedings of today's forum. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to this forum and we shall proceed in accordance with the advice of the chairperson. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you very much for that, um, providing some context to this important um, issue of migration, which has economic and political drivers um, shaping it. Um, we will leave it to the panelists to further probe, interrogate um, the nature of this process. The panelists, welcome again. You should have been told um, before, and I remind you that you have 10 minutes to make your presentation, 10 minutes, and I would give you a two minute warning. I would give you a two minute warning to wrap up your presentation. And we would take questions after everyone has presented. We would take questions in batches or groups as the case uh, may be. So I would now like to, to introduce Ms. Leanne Waldrop Bonner, um, who is a consultant with the International Organization for Migration, who is looking at the issue of Venezuelan migrant trends um, between 2019 and 2020 in the context of Trinidad and Tobago. I now invite Ms. Leanne Waldrop Bonner to make a presentation. 
Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. McCree. And please confirm that you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Yes, right. loud and clear. Great. Excellent. So good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and share on Venezuelan migrant trends in Trinidad and Tobago for the period 2019 to 2020. I am Leanne Waldrop on air and I'm representing the International Organization for Migration this morning. So a little background on the IOM, it was an is an organization that was established in 1951, and it is a leading organization in the field of migration. IOM is primarily dedicated to promoting humane and orderly migration for the benefit of all persons. And it consists of 174 member states, and it has maintained effective presence in Trinidad and Tobago since 2006. So this morning's presentation will be informed by particularly the displacement tracking matrix exercise that was conducted in 2019 and 2020, added to which we will be examining briefly the information source from beneficiary needs assessment and vocational training assessments in 2020. So a little background on the DTM exercise that involved both interviews and surveys. And in 2019, we were able to capture a sample size of 2,166 Venezuelan respondents. Whereas in 2020, given the COVID-19 pandemic, our interview approach changed and it was now telephone interviews and we had a sample size of 950 Venezuelan respondents. So what were the main findings of DTM 2020 as opposed to 2019. We know primarily the geographic location of the respondents who we were able to deduce that, and we noted that Pinal, Debe, Safari, and Rima had the highest number of respondents in 2019, as opposed to 2020, where we're seeing Hoover, Tabaki, Rima, and Shabonis having the highest number of respondents. Apart from that, the sex of the respondents were generally equitable, but we see some slight variation between the two years. And we know that the age group of the respondents were generally between the 25 to 34 age groups. Regarding the marital status of the respondents, we noted that almost um, the majority of them were either single or married in 2020, whereas in 2019, we noticed uh, a higher proportion of single respondents. Additionally, the educational level, we were able to discover that the 24 and under age group had completed secondary education in both years. Looking now at dependence, we were able to examine the location of the dependence. And in 2019, it was indicated by the respondents that their dependents were over 50% of the dependents their dependents were in the home country only, as opposed to 2020, where we're seeing over 50% of their, respond their dependents were in Venezuela and Trinidad. So there was a little change in terms of the location of the dependents, and that may be indicative of some family reunification efforts. The accommodation also indicated that persons with dependence in Trinidad and Tobago um, between both 2020 and 2019 were seeing that these persons were, at least a quarter of them, were leasing rooms based on our respondents' information. And this... Seems that we have um, lost Leanne there. I hope we can get her back. And I have now government. Hello, Le Leanne. Seems we have lost Leanne. Um, We'll have to manage this smartly.
Can you hear me now? Yeah, we, we lost you there for a few seconds. All right. Apologies. So maybe I should just head back one slide. Yes. In terms of accommodation. So the point here was that um, at least a quarter of our respondents with dependents in Trinidad and Tobago, both in 2020 and 2019, were actually leasing a room, which could lead to some accommodation issues as it relates to spacing, overcrowding, etc. Another area captured in the DTM exercise was government registration. And we note that at least 80% of the respondents, both in 2019 and 2020, registered during the government registration exercise for Venezuelan nationals in Trinidad and Tobago. Interestingly, as Dr. Sembenad noted in the introductory um, comments, a major impetus for migration has been economic um, opportunities, this, the, the quest for economic opportunities. And in 2019, we saw a moderate increase in employment but we saw a significant jump in unemployment as well. And as we progressed into our 2020 findings, we note that unemplo unemployment also showed an increase in 2020. However, we're seeing a decrease in employment, which may be symptomatic of the COVID-19 pandemic that has made um, employment opportunities for migrants and nationals alike particularly challenging. In terms of the work sector of the migrants subsequent to their migration process, we're seeing that the majority of respondents worked in the construction sector. And we're also able to, we were also able to detect that 62% um, of our respondents um, had heard of incidents of underpayment, particularly within the construction sector. Apart from that, um, a small percentage of our respondents knew of someone in their migrant community who was forced to work or perform other activities against their will. And once again, we're seeing these activities occurring primarily in the construction sector, followed by tourism and sex work. Additionally, 25% um, of the respondents had witnessed physical and sexual violence during their time in Trinidad and Tobago. And the issue of discrimination was also raised and 59% of our respondents felt discriminated against primarily because of their nationality. DTM 2020 was able to capture information on children and it was discovered that 65% of our respondents lived with 1,216 children of which a zero to four age group had the largest number of children. Additionally, education seemed to be a challenge for a significant number of children living with the respondents both in 2019 and 2020. DTM 2020, um, another team that was included in 2020 was health. And it was noted that 80% of the respondents in both years did not have access to sexual and reproductive health services. And this would certainly have some ramifications for the migrant population as well as the wider national population. Apart from that, 60% of the interviewees had experienced difficulties in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, with the worsened quality of food being the most pressing issue. Additionally, 68% of the unemployed respondents had lost their jobs due to the pandemic. So we're seeing the manifestations and the impacts of the COVID-19 on the migrant population based on our respondents' information. Finally, the DTM looked at the needs of the respondents and it was noted in both years that income generation and employment topped the priority listing of needs for the respondents. And we're seeing the shift in medical care as well as the introduction of food in 2020. So as indicated earlier, the beneficiary needs assessment, that was another assessment conducted by the IOM and it was a population of 1,316 respondents. And through this process, we were able to determine that 31% of the respondents had skills in culinary and cooking, 
areas, whereas 13% have tourism, entertainment, hospitality skills. Interestingly, Excuse me. two more uh, minutes, Leanne, two sure. more minutes. No problem, thanks. Interestingly, we note that the um, largest percentage of respondents came into Trinidad in 2019, and it was confirmed that their main reason for leaving their country was the economic crisis and political situation. Their living conditions um, were generally fair, but we noticed some safety challenges as well as some cleanliness challenges of their living conditions and spacious ch um, space challenges. The vocational training assessments on the other hand showed that the majority, well, the highest proportion of respondents were interested in entrepreneurship training as well as English classes. So in conclusion, um, the GTM data and other migrant um, assessments could certainly inform the programs and policies on migrants that are geared towards assisting vulnerable populations. Likewise, the BNE and VTA findings could contribute to improved economic opportunities and sustainable livelihoods for vulnerable populations. Therefore, as we constantly engage the ever-evolving situation of migration, um, we need to ensure that the existing needs of vulnerable populations are met. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Leanne, for that um, fascinating socioeconomic profile of Venezuelan migrants in Trinidad and Tobago. It sets up a, a sort of nice background um, for the next um, panelist and presentation um, by Ms. Maria Jose Flor Agreda. Maria is a doctoral student in sociology and public policy at Cornell University. And we are proud to say that she's also a graduate of Salesis, uh, having done the MSc in developmental in development statistics. And she would be examining the de-skilling of Venezuelan migrants, immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago, based on um, research that she, she did as a student here at Salesis. I now invite um, Maria to make a presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. McCree. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm just gonna uh, ask if somebody can let me know that you can see my, my screen and that you can hear me okay. Yes. Oh, something's happening here. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Jose, and I'm grateful and excited to be with you all today to discuss topics of migration. Um, as Dr. McCree mentioned, I'm currently studying a PhD, but I did live in Trinidad and Tobago a few years back and studied at Salesis, where I became really interested in the dynamics of migration to the Caribbean, specifically from Venezuela. Uh, but mainly focused on skill migrations, uh, uh, people who are professionals and their dynamics of immigration, more so on the mechanisms of the decisions of uh, these people uh, and their experiences that they undergo, uh, which are not always at the forefront of in the immigration conversation. So because of this, I conducted a study on skilled Venezuelan immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago and their experience of de-skilling. Now, the study that I conducted was in 2017, so it's a few years ago, uh, but it's still quite relevant because it provides insight into the experience of skilled uh, migrants and in, in Trinidad and Tobago. For my research, it was important to me to understand uh, their experience, not only from a numbers perspective, but also from their own stories. So I conducted interviews to understand how they felt, what, what were their, um, what were their insights into their particular experience from a human perspective instead of just as numbers. So we're going to look at specifically uh, what brain waste or de-skilling represents um, and how are immigrants um, uh, feeling the factors of de-skilling in Trinidad and Tobago, their experiences, and how they're dealing with being de-skilled. To start off, it's key for me to highlight the issue of brain drain versus brain waste or de-skilling. 
Historically in the Caribbean, when we discuss migration in general, we tend to sometimes think of immigrants, especially professional immigrants, leaving the region to go abroad, uh, maybe the UK, Canada, the US, to live and work there. So we talk a lot about brain drain, right? Of the well-educated people who are skilled in the Caribbean, who are engineers, who are doctors, but for one reason or another, leave uh, the Caribbean to go to other countries. This represents a cost for the Caribbean countries that educated those people because not only do they lose out on the resources that it took to train these individuals, but it also loses their human capital. This is very a very common migration dynamic, especially um, when it comes to South Nor migration movements. However, when it comes to South-South migration movements, this dynamic becomes a little bit murkier because we don't always think of Latin American and Caribbean countries also receiving skilled migrants from other Latin American and Caribbean countries, but the fact is that they do. And it is so interesting to explore this dynamic because it speaks to a broader issue of development and how a country can make use of the human capital um, of immigrants and how that is also valuable to a country. Um, as I mentioned previously, my research focuses specifically on Venezuelan immigrants who are skilled and have immigrated to Trinidad and Tobago. And to start off, it's really important to first explore why they even immigrate to Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, of course, we understand that broadly speaking and as many of my colleagues today will discuss, the economic and political crisis in Venezuela has created a strong push factor for professional people to leave the country. And being that Trinidad and Tobago is so close to Venezuela, it creates a pathway for many Venezuelans to immigrate to, especially if they already have friends and family networks. Historically, there's been a lot of migration from Venezuela to Trinidad because while Trinidad is still a development country, it is still one of the most developed in the, Car in the Caribbean region. And that is a strong pull factor. It is no secret that Trinidad is one of the richest country, countries with the most sources, uh, resources in the Caribbean. And that also shares quite a bit of Venezuela's economic profile, especially due to its oil industry, which also makes it very alluring for many of Venezuela's professional labor force, which is largely invo involved in this shared industry. So um, I'm going to read you a quote from a 33 year old computer engineer who I interviewed who used to work in the oil industry in Venezuela before moving to Trinidad and Tobago. And he says, I had so much hope when I came here and uh, I and my family really thought that me coming here would be a good decision. I thought that after completing my studies, he studied English, it would be easy to get a work permit and a resident visa. I thought I could then bring my family and we would all have papers. I really thought that because I'm an engineer, I would be able to get a job easily. Now, this is really interesting because it speaks directly to the expectations that skilled immigrants have before immigrating and how the possibility that those expectations are not going to be met in their country of destination. Um, and that may bring a lot of disappointment. This is because unlike skilled, unskilled immigrants, skilled immigrants tend to have higher hopes that their skill, that their professional training, that their background is going to give them a leg up wherever they go. And even though many realize that their experience is not going to be perfect, they do think that their skill will benefit them in the long run and will lead them to have some sort of immigration status that allows them to live and work freely. Um, and this is certainly not an expectation that somebody without skill or a professional degree or a technical degree is likely to have. Now, here I have used some data from a survey that was carried out throughout a few countries in Latin America by the Migration Policy Institute, TTM, and the IOM. Uh, uh, this data is from a report of Venezuelan immigrants that was published by the Migration Policy Institute in 2020. And one of the things that it looked at was um, educational attainment of Venezuelan immigrants across uh, various countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, well, we do see some very differences from country to country, if we focus on Trinidad and Tobago, we can gather that approximately 25% of Venezuelan immigrants in Trinidad and Tobago do have some form of educational attainment at the tertiary level, meaning that they are skilled or highly skilled. Now, I present data from my own study. Uh, I uh, did conduct a survey as well as uh, in-depth interviews and the survey was for uh, 40 skilled immigrants 
I did use purposive sampling, which is not representative, but does allow us to better understand the experience of skilled immigrants. The first graph of the survey shows us the areas that the migrants that I uh, surveyed specialized in, uh, which include um, information technology, social sciences. We see uh, quite a, a few of them uh, working on engineering, uh, having degrees on engineering and administration. In just opposition to this, though, the, pe the, the graph next to it shows us that these 40 people, where these 40 people were working, and we can clearly see a massive shift in the area uh, where they were skilled versus uh, the area that they were actually working on. Most of them, for instance, were working as cooks, uh, many working in sales and agriculture. Um, and so we can kind of get an idea of how maybe some doctors from the previous graph might have ended up as cooks in the next graph. Now I'm going to read you this quote from a woman who's an engineer and was working as a cook in Crown Point. Uh, by the way, all of the names are pseudonyms to protect the confidentiality of the people that I interviewed. And she says, I went to school for five years and had a lot of work experience, but here it doesn't matter. I could be a brain surgeon and it wouldn't matter. Employers here don't care that we have anything to contribute because we are not from here. There's a lot to unpack in that many of these immigrants feel that there is never a way for them to be part of the professional labor force in Trinidad, no matter how educated they are, simply because they're not Trinidadians and simply because they're uh, from Venezuela. Here, uh, the data from the survey that I conducted shows the perspective of immigrants as to why they thought was the main reason that they were being de-skilled, that they couldn't find a job in their, in their area. And, and 80% said that um, it was because they didn't have immigration status, while 20% said that it was because uh, they didn't really speak English. Interestingly, however, the people that said that it was because uh, they didn't speak English, they still mentioned that even if this is a key issue, um, even if they were to speak English, the lack of immigration status would still hold them from being able to attain a professional job. For Jaime, who's a 33-year-old engineer, he's an oil engineer, he had mentioned that he, when he had just immigrated to Trinidad, he had contacted potential employers, uh, but they told him to uh, go to English school, so he did. Um, but then after he graduated from English school, he contacted them and he says, I contacted the potential employer, so when I finished my English program, some of them refused to see me and others said that even though I have improved, they can hire me because I don't have my papers. I told them that maybe they could sponsor me and they refused. So for skilled immigrants, this becomes a sort of chicken and egg situation because they think that their skills will lead them to have immigration documentation, yet they need the immigration documentation so they can work professionally. Excuse me, Maria Jose, um, yes. two more minutes. Sure. So um, I mean, what, some of the key reasons that uh, immigrants are being de-skilled in Trinidad and Tobago are uh, discrimination, which is actually not part of what we would think as their preferred uh, occupation. I do have a couple of quotes here that kind of show, and we can maybe look, look at them later, that specifically state that even though people are being de-skilled they suffer mostly because they're being made fun of, they are, their, their language skills are being made fun of, and they think that people are, at their work are not appreciating them, not only because of who they are as professionals, but also because they're international. This is also very interesting because there's uh, a lot of immigrants felt that many of their own co-patriots were uh, discriminating them at work, and many of the older generation of Venezuelan immigrants were trying to distance themselves from the newer generation of immigrants and were very much discriminating against them. Something that I think it's important to highlight before we, we, we move forward is that many of the women who were professionals were extremely frustrated at the fact that on top of being the scale, they were facing sexual harassment at work. Um, and many of them even faced situations where their employers were insinuating that they were required sex for them to uh, continue uh, working. Um, and a lot of them were very uncomfortable having to deal with sexual harassment at work as a regular part of their work life. I want to highlight this quote from the Lorena, who says that it's just hard to realize that as a teacher, she's not teaching, but serving liquor to old men who see her as a piece of meat. 
So what this leads us to really kind of realize is that many of these immigrants are really not coping well with not being able to work and they're looking to travel to a third country. Many of them are in fact waiting only to save up enough money to get on a flight and go to a third country where they feel like they will have the ability to work in their own area and where they feel that they are going to be able to not suffer the levels of discrimination that they're suffering in Trinidad for being Venezuelan, for not speaking a language. Key takeaways that I feel are really interesting and important is that brain waste does exist in Trinidad. Um, and this is something that we cannot really uh, uh, evade, uh, but immigrants de-skilling experience is mainly due to discrimination. And this is how they feel that is the main factor that leads for that discrimination. And ultimately this, brain, this discrimination may lead to brain drain of migrants who have skills. So now we're not only losing our own skilled labor force, but we're also losing the migrant skilled labor force. Lastly, uh, and something that I feel is also really important to highlight as a key takeaway, is that more data is really required, is necessary, not just on general um, about immigrants, but specifically on skilled immigrants. Because if we are able to make use of their skills as a host country, then we are understanding better how to create policies. We are understanding better how to educate society and how to really make use of talent and human capital for national development. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria, for another fine presentation. One that complements the presentation of the first speaker and uh, that also goes beyond it as well as we are able to hear um, immigrants' experiences in their own words, interpreting their own realities. And I thank you for, for your presentation. Um, I want to now invite the third speaker, um, Ms. Amanda Solano, um, who is the protection officer of the UN Refugee Agency uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. And she's going to look at uh, international agendas for the promotion of human rights in the context of refugees and asylum seekers in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, I now invite her to make her presentation. Remind you, you have 10 minutes. I give you a two minute warning towards the end. Amanda. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the presentation. Please let me know um, if you can have a look at my, if you can look at my presentation. Yes, you could put it on um, screen. It is, is, you can see in full screen? You could put it on full screen, yeah. Okay, in my computer, it's in full screen. Okay, all right. It's not in yours? No, but we are seeing it. Let me try it. Yeah. What about now? I think the previous one. <laughs> now? Yeah, but we, we have it. We have uh, we are seeing it. So you may you may proceed. Okay. Okay, thank you. So um to go right in, um, I want to talk about the maybe to provide an introduction to the international protection in Trinidad and Tobago uh, background or current context. Um, to say that in the year of 2000, Trinidad and Tobago acceded to the 1951 Convention and its protocol, which is the main international treaty that covers the issues of refugees uh, worldwide. In 2014, a national refugee policy was drafted, and this led to the later creation of a refugee unit under the Trinidad and Tobago Immigration Division, as well as the establishment of UNHCR office in the country to support the efforts of the national government. And in 2019, the government allowed for Venezuelan nationals to register under the migrant registration framework um, and provided a work permit to those Venezuelans who registered at that time. 
some of the work that we have been doing as UNHCR to complement the efforts of the national authorities um, from since 2016 are related in the first course to education because refugees and asylum seekers in the country have very limited or no access to the national education system. So we have developed a platform called the WARE, which allows for a, a program that is mixed uh, um, online and in person to uh, study. However, one of the disadvantages is that they do not get national certification from this study. But at the same time, the advantage is that allow them to continue study while in the country. And it's important to say that this modality was virtual even before COVID. So when COVID hit, we were prepared to continue with the program, which also include nationals of the countries, not just for asylum seekers and refugees. Then we also work with community engagement because we want host communities to see and understand the benefit of hosting refugees and asylum seekers. So we work on and improving the community as such. We work on health and including mental health and psychosocial support. And also we work on livelihoods, which is in very important since not everyone has access to work permits. So we have to remember that work permit was only allowed was only given to those who registered, but there's many more that have not registered, and I will talk about that later on. But despite all efforts to improve the livelihood opportunities, we still have to do some uh, interventions uh, in terms of cash cash interventions. So we will support some of the refugees and asylum seekers with in cash so they can pay for rent or buy food or pay for other expenses however this is complementary so it will not cover all the needs and it will not benefit a hundred percent of the population given budgetary constraints we also conduct our own registration because as i already mentioned the government has only allowed registration for some venezuelans and we actually have 40 different nationalities of individuals who are seeking asylum. So we conduct our own registration. However, when the government is ready or when the country is ready to take over a, full, a more um, a larger registration program, we will be transferring all the all this information of the persons registered with us, as well as we inform the national authorities on monthly basis of everyone who is registered with us or have departure from the country, etc. And we conduct refugee status determination um, while the government sets up their own system for conducting refugee status determination and for a very limited number of refugees at very high risk, we will support their resettlement into a third country, meaning that they are recognized as refugees in Trinidad and Tobago by UNHCR, and they will be supported to go and live in a third country where they will continue to live as refugees with the opportunity of later becoming nationals of that country. And then we work on public information and advocacy because we want people to understand who are the refugees, what is the situation, what are their achievements, as well as their challenges. We, of course, cannot do this work alone. So we work very closely with the civil society of organizations, including Living Water Community, who help us with the registration process, with the cash-based intervention. They also do case management. They provide legal assistance and they supported the WARE platform for education. We work with Family Planning Association on sexual and reproductive health, as well as pediatric health care, because uh, migrants in the country are only allowed to primary health services and sometimes there is challenges we try to complement and also we work with rape crisis society for mental health and psychosocial support services including in presence but also virtual assistance and from february of this year we look forward to work with the pan american development foundation on social cohesion or integration especially in the area of chaguanas
then it's important to mention that these days uh, there are what we call mixed movements which are movements of persons traveling together usually irregularly but not necessarily that combine different profiles of individuals so among these movements we might find migrants we'll find asylum seekers refugees maybe stateless persons unaccompanied person unaccompanied minors separated minors and this makes it very complex because of a group of 50 individuals is not clear at first hand which ones are refugees and which ones belong to other categories so just to help with the terminology um but when we talk about refugees we are talking about persons who cannot return to their country of origin so they are in a in a country where they are not nationals and they are there because they have a fear of persecution due to violence or due to conflict or violations of human rights when we talk about asylum seekers we're talking about individuals who have sought asylum but their cases have not yet been processed so they are waiting to see if their situation fills the definition of refugee or not when we talk about migrants we're talking about persons who are not fleeing from persecution so the definitions are very wide but the main difference that we see between a migrant and a refugee is that they are not fleeing for because of persecution or fear to return to their country of origin and then lately many people refer to venezuelans displaced abroad which is not a legal term but is a term to talk about venezuelans who are out of their country of origin and maybe they have not sought asylum yet but they would most likely feel the definition of refugee under the cartagena declaration which is a regional declaration that expanded the definition of refugee in the 1951 uh, convention. Just to give you some numbers, and what I want to point out in this graphic is the top part. Um, we have uh, in blue the number of ref Venezuelan refugees. So these would be the refugees who have completed the procedure and it has been determined that they fill the definition. Then in red, we have the number of asylum seekers, which is persons who are awaiting for their case to be processed and then determine whether or not they fill the definition of refugees. And then in green, we have the largest numbers, which is what we just called Venezuelans displaced abroad, who might be refugees, um, but they have not sought asylum as of yet. In Trinidad and Tobago, however, uh, we have asylum seekers and refugees from 40 different nationalities for a total of 21,577 persons registered with UNHCR, not with the national government. And Venezuelans are 86 to 87%, but we also have a number of Cubans and, and persons from other nationalities mainly in productive age which i think was also reflected by the two previous panelists this is where they are living in trinidad and tobago so you can see in the map uh, that we have persons all over the country including tobago but where you see the dark darker darkest blue color is where the majority of them reside um of of all the uh, asylum seekers and refugees registered with UNHCR, about 6,000 of them are also registered with the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Amanda, what are some... two minutes. Okay, thank you. So what are, what are some of the main challenges that we see as UNHCR? The first one would be uh, the absence of refugee legislation. I mentioned that there is a policy draft However, there is no legislation, so there's no complete framework. Um, then the second one would be the restricted access to basic needs and livelihood opportunities, given that not everybody has access to, to work permits. 
then restricted access to education and xenophobia and gender-based violence. However, there are achievements and opportunities. So some of the main achievements would be the registration process that the government took in, 19, in 2019 and renew in 2020 and 2021. Then we see positively that um, there is access to primary health care and that they, they were included in the COVID-19 vaccination drive, as well as we see uh, local integration opportunities. I could mention the example of Chaguanas, where there is a volleyball team, which was funded by uh, Venezuelan refugees and asylum seekers who got together with uh, Trinidadians, and now they are developing their own tournaments. There is also some inclusion of and opportunities, sorry, opportunities for including refugee and, and asylum seeker migrants in the education system to ex expand their registration program and to develop a framework that would allow a migratory status in the country. And finally, I want to say that obviously UNHCR does not work alone in Trinidad and Tobago, but also doesn't work alone in the entire region. And there is a um, regional refugee and migrant response plan called the RMRP developed in 17 countries who are hosting uh, Venezuelan refugees, asylum seekers and migrants that have 192 organization of which 23 of them are, are led by refugees and migrants. And they work together to improve the conditions in terms of shelter, health, education, protection, and to foster the integration under the R4B platform or response for Venezuelans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda, for a presentation that focused um, particularly on the, the kind of policy interventions or developmental interventions that have been carried out by the UN Refugee Agency in Trinidad and Tobago and the type of partnerships that um, you have also developed as part of these interventions. I thank you for that um, enlightenment. I would now uh, like to introduce Ms. Giselle Chance to make a presentation. Ms. Chance is the co-founder and CEO of Vision on Mission that um, provides services and interventions um, directed towards promoting the human rights and well-being of deportees or deportee populations, sorry, in Trinidad and Tobago. I now invite Ms. Chance to make her presentation. You have 10 minutes and I give you a two minute warning towards the end. Thank you, Chair. And I'm Giselle Chance, and I'm happy to present on interventions, services and interventions directed towards promoting the human rights and well being of deported populations in Trinidad and Tobago this morning. Are you sharing your screen? Yes, I am. You have to click again. Okay. We're not seeing it. Okay. Are you seeing now? Okay. Yes, yes. Great. My apologies. No problem. <laughs> okay. So once more, I'm pleased to be here as part of this forum representing Vision on Mission. And as we speak to the issue of deportee, and interventions in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, deportation is a formal removal of foreign nationals from one country for violating an immigration law and or having committed a criminal offense. And from the latter part uh, period of the 1990s to present, Trinidad and Tobago has experienced a wave of deportations of its nationals uh, being repatriated from uh, countries such as United States of America, Canada, and the United Kingdom. And recent research shows that between the period of January 2003 and December 2016, a total of 5,580 TNT nationals were deported with a significant number of, uh, of that figure being males as, as 
in comparison to females. Moreover, since the onset of the global COVID-19 pandemic in 2019 to date, Vision on Mission has assisted the state in quarantining and housing 63 deportees. And I would like to say at this juncture that the information coming from the state in immigration department to civic organizations such as Vision on Mission is not formalized at this time. And I'm going to be mentioning further down in my uh, recommendations how this should be strengthened and improved upon. Deportees in Trinidad and Tobago can face several challenges, oftentimes similar to those experienced by other migrant subpopulations. And some of these challenges can include adjustment and resettlement into TNT's culture, post-traumatic stress symptoms associated being separated from their families, stigmatization, economic, hard, economic hardships, which can include difficulty in accessing employment and food, homelessness, poor mental and physical health, deterioration in, fam in familial relationships, addiction and substance abuse, as well as limited access to state-supported social services as a result of having no identification documents. So these challenges make deportees an at-risk subpopulation that is vulnerable to becoming socially displaced and having tendencies towards criminal behavior and crime. Moreover, this unexpected return and unplanned migration continues to have some impact on public safety and national development. And uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, of Foreign and Caricom Affairs continues to grapple with this situation. And uh, we as an NGO, we are engaged in the reintegration of offenders and resettlement of repatriated citizens. And we believe that there are several interventions and services that must be in place if we are to promote human rights and the well being of deportees in Trinidad and Tobago. However, I wish to first highlight Vision and Missions interventions directed to deportees at this time. We provide accommodation at our in transit center and rehabilitative estates as well as starter apartments in Lavantil, which provides our clients with cheaper rental facilities and aiding them in their transition into independent living. Deportees that voluntarily access vision and mission services can be accommodated for a minimum of two years and indeed to a maximum of five years in some instances. As we understand that it is difficult, the process of reintegration and resettlement is often a difficult journey. We also provide food and clothing and upon their immediate repatriation to Trinidad and Tobago, care packages, clothing and meals are provided to deportees accommodated by vision on mission. Hampers and financial assistance are also available thereafter upon needs assessment. Vision and Mission also assists with job placement. Mm -hmm. And we assist our deportees in finding employment and continuing to engage with various stakeholders to increase opportunities for job placement. We also assist with document retrieval and as stated earlier, many deportees have difficulty accessing basic social services such as healthcare, state financial grants, educational and employment opportunities as a result of having no identification documents on their return. So we assist with the, with, with the retrieval of birth certificates, ID cards, etc. We also provide counseling via our resident psychologists to assist deportees with, their, in, with coping with their oftentimes traumatic experience 
associated with their deportation. We also facilitate our clients access to the ministries of health, mental health care facilities so that our clients can receive additional treatment, medications and interventions where necessary. We, are also, we also actively participate in the skill development and training of our clients. And some of our in-house initiatives include our agricultural program and barbering training facility. And this is designed to equip our clients with the ability to be self-employed and to improve their earning potential. Some of our more macro recommend recommendations for interventions regarding this subpopulation are research and planning. And we believe in a collaborative approach. And we think that efforts should be made to involve public and private bodies in the promotion of research in repatriation and treatment and resettlement of deportees. As I said before, before in my introduction, data regarding this subpopulation can at times be difficult to uh, obtain. And Vision and Mission does its own research only with clients that voluntarily access our services. Policy formation and program, repatriation measures and programs should be systematically planned and implemented as an integral part of the criminal justice system within the national development process. We also believe that a minimum standard rules for deportees should be established. And this speaks to a repatriation policy that ensures a proper balance of human rights of the deportees and takes in takes into consideration concern for society, public safety, crime prevention, and resettlement of deportees. We are also of the view that these measures should be applied without discrimination on the grounds of race, color, sex, age, language, religion, political or, or other opinion, property, or social status. We, we believe that flexibility should also be provided and considered inconsistent with the nature and gravity of the deportee's offense. So the personality and background of the deportee should be assessed to cater to the protection of society and to avoid unnecessary stigmatization, as well as to uphold their human rights. Training for staff employed with the reintegration of deportees is essential so that staff can be clear of their responsibilities in the execution and in the execution of them. Giselle, excuse me, two more minutes. Thank you. We also believe in a drive for public education. So public agencies, the private sector and the general public should be encouraged to support voluntary organizations such as Vision on Mission to promote repatriation and resettlement of deportees. So there is a role for the civil, civil society, including Vision on Mission and other faith-based organizations. And I highlighted in red here some of the uh, services evidence-based interventions that can be offered to our deportees. And that includes assessment, uh, therapy, cognitive behavior, behavioral therapies, character and citizenship training, care, support, supervision, and surveillance over a period of three years for best results, uh, education in, re in relation to restorative justice values, processes, programs, and principles, spiritual introspection and mindfulness and cultural education. So we cannot stress enough the cooperation that needs to be promoted between countries in the field of repatriation so that uh, human rights uh, can be sustained 
and research and training can continue in this field and to also facilitate the provision of, of technical assistance and the exchange of information between territories. We believe that Trinidad and Tobago can benefit from comparative studies and harmonization of legislative provisions to further expand the range of services we provide to deportees whilst upholding their human rights and ensuring their public safety. I'd like to thank uh, everyone on behalf of Vision and Mission for the opportunity to share in this forum. Thank you, Giselle, for another important presentation focusing on a particular group of individuals in our society who have been stigmatized and marginalized in ways some of us don't understand. And, and thanks for shedding light on some of your past and ongoing interventions to help improve their lives in the areas of um, housing, uh, education, and uh, also thanks for sharing with, with us your wide ranging list of you know, interventions and recommendations suggested to continue to help um, these individuals um, lead a, a, you know, a, a life um, that is uh, of a particular you know, um, standard and, and have a particular quality of life that is acceptable in our society. So thanks for your insights and presentation. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Ms. Leela Ramdeen, who is the chairperson Ms. Ramdeen, there's a term here, I haven't seen it before, so excuse the bad pronunciation. She's a chairperson of the ARC Diocesan Ministry for Migrants and Refugees. I don't know if it should be ARC Diocese, but you are the chairperson of that um, particular entity. And uh, your, you deal with particularly the services and interventions directed towards promoting human rights of immigrant populations in Trinidad and Tobago, specifically, specifically from the standpoint of a faith-based organization. Ms. Ramlin, I now invite you to make your presentation. 10 minutes. Thank you, thank you, Dr. McCree. So good day, my friends, and it is my pleasure to represent the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Port of Spain, Charles Jason Gordon, at this important event. The aim of the Catholic Church is to build a civilization of love, underpinned by the love of God and love of neighbor. And as we are taught in the parable of the Good Samaritan, our neighbor is anyone in need of us. And this includes, of course, migrants and refugees. We believe that each person is made in God's image and likeness with an inherent dignity, which we are called to protect and promote. We are about promoting integral human development, the development of each person and of every dimension of the person. Pope Francis reminds us that migrants and refugees are not pawns on the chessboard of humanity. They are children, women, and men who leave or who are forced to leave their homes for various reasons, who share a legitimate desire for knowing and having, but above all, for being more. They do not only represent a problem to be solved, but our brothers and sisters to be welcomed, respected, and loved, end of quote. He has asked each diocese across the world to welcome, protect, promote, and integrate migrants and refugees. So while we recognize that Trinidad and Tobago cannot accommodate all those who may wish to come to our shores, we need to put in place humane systems to deal with those who do come. Doing what is right to meet the needs of our own citizens does not prevent us from showing compassion and hospitality to migrants and refugees in need of support and, and protection. So in Trinidad and Tobago, we've had a long history of migration. My own maternal grandmother came from Venezuela. And on the 6th of December, 1858, my paternal grandparents arrived in Trinidad and Tobago on the ship that needed more from India as indentured workers. Living Water Community, a Catholic ecclesial community, has been working with migrants and refugees for more than 30 years. And it is the implementing partner, as we've heard, of the UNHCR. And in Trinidad and Tobago, migrants and refugees have come from over 40 countries, as has already been said. 
Archbishop Jason has undertaken a number of initiatives to address the needs of the increasing migrant population. In 2018, in May, he established the Archdiocese Ministry for Migrants and Refugees and placed responsibility for this ministry within a commission that I was already chairing, the Catholic Commission for Social Justice. I'm the chair of both organizations. I'm also an attorney at law. He mandated that each parish establishes a, a parish ministry for migrants and refugees called PMMRs. And there are 61 parishes in our, in, in our country, Trinidad and Tobago. 27 of them have already done so. They've established PMMRs. Many others are working to achieve this goal. AMMR, that's the Archdiocese Ministry for Migrants and Refugees, provide guidance, training, and support to parishes across our country. We hold monthly virtual meetings with PMMR members to ensure that there's a constant flow of communication with those on the ground. We need funding to achieve our goals. And in October 2020, CCSJ, I, I signed a one-year partnership project with UNICEF entitled Protection and Wellbeing of Children on the Move in Trinidad and Tobago. So the total sum was 1.724 million, just over that. And of that, UNICEF gave uh, 1.135 plus million and we provided the rest in cash and in kind. This provided us with an opportunity to work with parishes and others to meet the varied needs of migrants and refugees. While the project focused specifically on Venezuelan children, by extension, their families also benefited from our work. The agreement ended on the 31st of December, 2021, but UNICEF, thank God, has agreed to sign a new three-year agreement with us, and it should commence next month. We've also raised some funds via the US Embassy from the Julia Taft Fund in America, and, and by screening the film Sufra at Movie Town, it's about the resilience of a group of Lebanese refugee women, and we, we raised further funds from that, and we received donations from well-wishers both in Trinidad and Tobago and abroad. As well as financial aid, we received aid in kind, for example, training opportunities for our staff. All members of staff have to undergo the, the PSE um, a, uh, training from UNICEF about uh, to prevent sexual abuse. And we've received 70 electronic tablets from IOM for use by some of our students on our online classes. IOM has also distributed personal protective equipment, PPEs, to migrants and refugees through our PMMRs in parishes. The UNICEF funds allow us to appoint a number of staff who were either fully or partially funded by UNICEF. And here's a, 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 an image of, of the, the staff um, who, we are, who are, are there with us, a program coordinator. Some of them are funded by UNICEF and some by the Archdiocese. Program coordinator, Darren Orion. We've got a community liaison officer, migrant support officer, a psychologist who is a case management officer for alternative care. And throughout the project, she has worked closely with Children's Authority, other stakeholders to provide alternative care for the 138 plus migrant children who arrived alone or were separated from their families. Alternative care, of course, focused also on fostering or community-based care arrangements. And we also have well, the Archdiocese appointed a research and social media officer, Dominique Hefes Doon, who gives human service in supporting our work. And we have a finance and administrative officer and we've recently appointed um, an, evaluate, an evaluator who is evaluation, evaluating the, the work we have done so far. Collaboration with others, working with migrants and refugees is critical if we are to optimize the use of limited resources. Key members of Living Water Community sit on a steering committee that I've established, and we work with both local and international organizations such as IOM, as I said, who provided us with some tablets, um, electronic devices. We also work with UNHCR, UNICEF, Society of St. Vincent de Paul, which operates in most of our 61 parishes. We work with NGOs such as La Casita, the Children's Authority, Ministry of National Securities, Counter Trafficking Unit, and so on. And we also sit on the R4V, the Regional Interagency Co Coordination Platform, which is led by IOM and UNHCR. To date, CCSJ is the Catholic Commission and, and AMMR's projects with and for migrants have focused on the following main projects. And I'll go through each of those um, separately. First is child-friendly spaces. These offer some form of education and psychosocial support for migrant children from Venezuela. 
The Catholic Education Board of Management is a legal and official body representing the archdiocese in the management of the diocese schools. We have 118 primary schools, seven secondary, um, the 21 secondary Catholic schools, but seven are run by us. We continue to knock on the Minister of National Security's door to waive the need for a permit to, to be granted to each child and to send a waiver to the Chief Immigration Officer so that nearly 3,000 Venezuelan children can enter our Catholic schools. You recall the Prime Minister said, we're not allowing them in our state schools, but if the Catholic Church want to enter, have, have them in our, in our Catholic schools, we can do so. So we found spaces and yet since 2018, we can't get the waiver, so the children legally cannot enter schools. And the principals and teachers can go to jail if they try to educate without this waiver. Since Venezuelan children are not allowed to enter schools, they need an opportunity to learn. Many of them are left alone while their parents go out to work or go looking for work. So prior to the lockdown, five parish priests in Capitima, La Romaine, Pinal, Mon Diablo, and Mayaro had opened what we call child-friendly spaces, which attempted to provide psychosocial support and other services to migrant children. More than 500 Venezuelan children participated in these spaces, and people who supported included people like a, a senior magistrate from Venezuela who couldn't get jobs here, a job here because um, of, of the difficulties that have been explained before by another speaker. With the support of funds from UNICEF and the Julia Taft Fund from the US Embassy, we have been hosting virtual online child-friendly spaces since the 11th of January last year. Four facilitators are paid monthly stipends to run the sessions. A pool of additional facilitators is used for teaching special lessons. There's a fifth facilitator who teaches in um, English as a second language three times a week on afternoons. We aim to equip migrants with the functional language skills they need to function and thrive in a country that does not speak their native language. The child-friendly spaces run online Monday to Friday, morning and afternoon. The students have been separated in groups according to the ages, five to eight, nine to 12, and 13 to 17. The facilitators undergo training and team meetings are organized on Mondays and Fridays to prepare them for the sessions. We've also launched an Instagram and TikTok page so that the content from the sessions can be shared with the wider public. Of course, no Excuse pictures. Me, Ms. Ramdeen. Sorry? Um, two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay. All right. Um, so uni, we, UNICEF has, um, funds have helped us to outfit the, the different um, spaces. Alternative care program, we try, we don't have a culture for fostering. And so that has proved very difficult, but shelly um, who is working as the psychologist in this area is, is working to try and, 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 and train. We've trained clinical psychologists social workers and others to help us to identify people on the ground who will be able to support. Healthcare, as we've, you've heard before, there's xenophobia. So although the government said there's primary healthcare and that they can um, get healthcare for TB, COVID-19, HIV, AIDS, et cetera, many of them, when they go to their, their health centers, uh, they face xenophobia. And so we have roaming healthcare um, uh, systems in place and we have a virtual meet the doctor program we also have a legal aid clinic uh, with the support of a, a, um, a partner a retired partner from a law firm and a retired judge and the law association sent out a letter and uh, that i wrote over 100 attorneys have signed up to help us food distribution remember the government gave two million two tranches of two million four million to the catholic church other um, churches and uh, faith communities got money too but we match that and then when the money and um, we, we know the Archbishop asked people to support and more money is coming in from uh, the pews to help. Shelter is a real challenge. We know that people living in the forest, on the beaches, etc. And we, we, we do what we can. Clothing, parishioners help with that and psychosocial care. Um, there is a, a fellow who is, his grace has just included his letter, um, Eduardo Patrice who is a journalist from Venezuela who rightly said, while you are trying to feed our hungry bellies, et cetera, don't forget our spiritual needs. And then assistance in seeking employment. We have a WhatsApp um, across the nation. One, WhatsApp, one yes, a WhatsApp group. And, and they give 
um, they help with, with identifying employment. Training and development, as I say, the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse course is offered to all our PMMRs. These are just some of the initiatives in which we have all, will, are involved. We will continue to advocate for a legislative framework that will facilitate the promotion of the rights of migrants and refugees. I end with a quote from Pope Francis who said, once the health crisis passes, God willing, we will think no longer in terms of them and those, but only us. It is for this reason the theme of his message this year was towards an ever wider we, in order to indicate a clear horizon for a common journey in this world. We have to build together a future of justice and peace, ensuring that no one is left behind. There's much work to be done, and we need all hands on deck. So let's work together to build a just society. I thank you. Um, thanks much, Ms. Ramdeen. In her presentation, uh, Ms. Solano, and I think um, in the presentation, of Ms. Waldrop Bonnet as well, both um, referred to the important partnerships that they, they have with, um, with the church uh, in helping to deal with the, the challenges faced by you know, refugee, asylum, displaced um, people in this country. And I want to thank Ms. Ram, Ramdeen for giving us a, a further insights into the various initiatives that uh, her organization have been taking and the capacity building initiatives as well to strengthen her team so that they can deliver um, particular services, particular projects targeting persons in our society who remain very vulnerable. So I thank you for that, um, throwing more insight into the work of your organization in this important area. I now wish to invite our uh, final presenter, Dr. Michelle Reese. Um, Dr. Reese is a private consultant who has had a long-standing long -standing interest um, in this area of, of migration, both local and international. And uh, she is examining you know, the engagement of diaspora communities and groups in national development in, in this country. I now ask Dr. Reese to make a presentation. Okay, so thank you. I don't have any... Um slides, I'm not like the other presenters. Um, I just want to say that um, the three pillars of my presentation this morning will focus one, on what diaspora engagement has been traditionally like in Trinidad and Tobago, particularly for us where we don't have a mobilized uh, sufficient platform like many of the other countries in the region so it doesn't mean that diaspora engagement is not happening, but we look a little bit at what that looks like. So a little overview. And then I thought I would focus on diaspora engagement, particularly in the times of COVID, because this has now upped the ante for our diaspora members to become involved in the relief and recovery efforts during the pandemic, but also in terms of planning for beyond the pandemic. And thirdly, the last development would be the elaboration of a national diaspora policy, which I am very fortunate to be working on with the Ministry of Foreign and Caricom Affairs. So that is likely to be a huge game changer in terms of the way we move forward. So first of all, diaspora, the term diaspora refers to overseas nationals, people who have left their country of origin, have resettled in another country and either remain as individuals or form parts uh, or parts of groups, they belong to associations. But the important thing is that they still have a vested interest in the homeland. So they participate actively in various aspects of national life. They may maintain homes here, they may have plans to retire here. They are involved in at various levels in development in the home. Now, as I mentioned before, Trinidad and Tobago is playing a little bit of catch up vis-a-vis um, -vis the counterparts in the Caribbean region and in the wider Latin American region where diaspora engagement is something that has already been happening and there's already platform or mechanism to enable this two-way flow. It has to be mutually beneficial so that 
diaspora individuals and groups need to know if I give up my time and my expertise, what am I getting in return, right? And so the individuals in the homeland have to also be accepting of assistance coming from abroad, whether it is financial, whether it is through social remittances, the sharing of expertise and so on, um, whatever the format it may take. So we have a large, very well dispersed diaspora. Um, according to IOM statistics in 2017, we're looking at roughly 400,000 Trinidadian and Tobagoian citizens living abroad, spread over four continents or more. And whilst they are geographically dispersed, a lot, many of them are part of well-established diaspora organizations. Some of them are umbrella organizations that bring together a range of smaller diaspora groups and associations. And they've remained active, even though the, the population at large may not be aware of some of the initiatives that are taking place in education, in health, in culture, in community development, in energy, in many different areas and aspects of, of our national life. So what that means is that in the absence of a formal mechanism that allows uh, Trinidadians and Tobagonians abroad to give back, it means that a lot of the engagement currently is ad hoc, it's reactionary. We saw it a few years ago when we had those terrible floods where there was an out pouring of interest and concern from abroad, but also groups send a lot of relief um, supplies and equipment to assist, particularly when it affected their hometowns. So lots of initiatives take place on a day-to-day -day basis without us even being aware. We have a lot of people in the diaspora who are very, very highly skilled, and very well placed. So people like the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, his alma mater, CIC, he has contributed wings, right? Funded the actual expansion of the, the physical building, right? And we have multiple examples of, of these. Doctors who conduct workshops um, at their own expense, and there are multiple, multiple examples of this. The problem is that once you do not have a formal mechanism in place as exists in Haiti, where since 1995, they have had a dedicated ministry to deal with their overseas nationals, or where other countries such as Jamaica, even Grenada, may have a diaspora division, a diaspora desk, whatever it is, a unit, right? Usually falling under the purview of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, secondarily, some countries choose the Ministry of National Security, depending on what the slant is or what the objectives are. What this means is that it becomes more difficult, it is more onerous, it is more costly, it is more bureaucratic to have to engage with the homeland without this formal mechanism that facilitates, right? And this is one of the things that is critical in diaspora engagement, that you must have an enabling environment and you must have a facilitatory environment in order for this to take place. So enter the pandemic and now the impetus to, to do at home and to give back is even more acute. And the two most visible areas where engagement has happened at the level of the diaspora both in terms of individuals and well-established diaspora associations are obviously in the areas of education and health. So immediately after the pandemic um, started to affect us, the Ministry of, of Education established that somewhere between 65, 60 to 65,000 students were not accessing or could not access online classes, either because they had no devices, or they did not have the infrastructure and the hardware necessary, necessary to, able, to be able to have virtual classes. And 
about a year later or six months to a year later, that figure was halved. And in many of the initiatives were due not only to the local partners and the international stakeholders who got involved, including people like, including organizations like UNICEF, but through in diaspora individuals and well-established associations donating laptops, donating uh, tablets, and that was one of the major issues. And this is an ongoing exercise. A lot of it has happened through what we call a hometown association. Hometown associations are basically, um, they function like NGOs where people have an affinity to the, whole, the town in which they grew up or the village. And so they contribute to its development through these associations. So, Education was one of the major areas. In August 2020, with the, with the assistance of the Ministry of Education, partnering with the Trinidad and Tobago Diaspora uh, Network based in Washington, education specialists, Trinidad and Tobago education specialists based in Washington, actually organized over a two day period, August 4th and 5th of 2020. 21st uh, century teaching skills designed to get our education specialists here, as well as administrators and so on, the necessary support to switch from the traditional face-to-face -face learning to a virtual platform. This has unfortunately not continued. And this is where if you had a, a, a diaspora policy that was already implemented, this would have facilitated ongoing training, webinars, workshops in this area. So that's an example in terms of diaspora engagement with our professionals in education. And we have examples, of course, in health. So just prior to the gifting of Pfizer vaccines, again, through the TT Dan, the Trinidad Tobago Diaspora Network in Washington, they organized a series of panels with healthcare professionals who cross-cut a wide range of areas in immunology, pediatric care, um, pharmaceuticals, et cetera. And some of them who actually had experience working in Trinidad, sort of uh, in preparation for vaccine uptake, ensuring that the vaccine numbers um, would remain stable in the beginning. And there are ongoing plans to continue a series of webinars to ensure that vaccine uptake is increased because as we know it has, um, has lagged considerably. But also there were other groups that looked at the issue of mental health and psychosocial support, particularly for young people who have been severely affected either through loss of family members um, having family members lose income and just being able to switch to that virtual platform. So um, through a women's organization, diaspora organization, a lot of the psychosocial support involved looking at young people, how they've transitioned to the virtual learning, how they coped overall with issues arising directly from COVID-19 and training them to also identify uh, needs, mental health needs among their peers so that um, we would mitigate things like suicides and so on and other um, negative behaviors associated with the pandemic. Excuse and me, lastly, Michelle, two more minutes. That's fine. Lastly, the diaspora policy, which is uh, under the auspices of the Ministry of Foreign and Caribbean Affairs, seeks to legitimize that relationship with the diaspora and formalize it with the homeland. It crosscuts many different areas. There are about 14 different areas that I identified for direct impact in terms of national development. And of course, like all policies, it's aligned with our vision 2030 strategy so that it includes things like climate change, disaster management, health and education, tourism, crime and violence, um, a whole host of other areas. And the idea is that 
a formal structure is developed so that there's a communication strategy, there is an engagement strategy, that the reforms that are required, whether it's at immigration, whether it's among the diplomatic missions, that all of the mechanisms are in place to facilitate diaspora engagement so that it streamlines um, our ability to harness the potential that the diaspora possesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle, um, for focusing on another area that has been talked about for some years now, the, the, the Caribbean diaspora in general, the Trinidad and Tobago diaspora in particular, and pointing to some of the issues in relation to public policy provision, as well as the attempts to create some kind of public policy framework to engage and facilitate um, uh, persons of um, Trinidad and Tobago descent who wish to become more involved in the development um, process in their, in their home country. Um, thanks for sharing insights into what is going on as we speak in attempt to, um, to target and to, to accommodate and incorporate, integrate, whatever term you want to use um, to really reach out to these persons and facilitate their involvement in our local development and national development. So I thank you for giving us those insights and that update on this issue of the local diaspora. So that brings us um, to the end of the formal presentations. I, I want to thank all the panelists um, again for uh, and their organizations for sparing the time and effort to share with us um, their their, some of their achievements, uh, their problems, their pressures, um, their, their hopes and plans for, for tackling and dealing with the important issues related to immigration, the I and the E, you know. And uh, I would now like to uh, open up, well, it has been opened up already. <laughs> we have received questions. So I would now like to pose some of the questions to you that we have received in the chat, I would uh, ask a batch of three to four questions and invite your response. In some cases, I provide, I read from the screen comments, apart from just posing the questions. So let me check, I'm doing this in real time. So there might be a little delay sometimes. Okay, this question is from Melissa. And it is for Amanda. What can be done to protect any migrant in Trinidad and Tobago since the 2014 refugee status determination is only a draft and not implemented? And yet there is no migrant public policy. Mm -hmm. Amanda, I think you can also see this in the chat. What can be done to protect any migrant in Trinidad and Tobago since the 2014 refugee status determination, or I think that should be legislation, is only a draft and not implemented, and yet there's no migrant public policy? Thank you. Thank you for the question. No, so but, um, before I respond, um, sorry, uh, Amanda, just let me um, give a a couple more questions. Uh, this is for Miss Leanne, uh, Miss Waldrop. Reference is made to the Global Compact for Migrants and Refugees. How has the DTM data collected aided in a collaboration for a migration policy in Trinidad and Tobago? Reference is made to the Global Compact for Migrants and Refugees. How has the DTM data collected aid? How has it aided in a collaboration for a migrant for a migration policy in Trinidad and Tobago? And this is a question from Akila to all panelists. Can you share some successful reintegration stories of deportees and share how they overcame major challenges? Can you share some successful reintegration stories of deportees 
and share how they overcame major challenges, even and especially after striking out on their own. I invite responses. Um, sorry about that, Amanda, you may proceed. Yes. You're on, you're muted. Okay, sorry, I couldn't unmute. Okay. Thank you, thank you for the question. Um, so to respond, I would say that, um, obviously the question implies that a legal framework is needed and I would agree to that. So right now we have a draft, it's a good start, but it would be ideal if it could be finalized into a national law to have a framework. However, while there is no national framework, it is important to say that when a country accedes to an international convention, there is an expectation that they will uh, honor the commitments. So it's important also to include the judiciary system. So when they issue decisions, this can also be taken into account as well as customary law. For example, the principle of non refoulement of not returning someone to the country where they would fear um, for their lives is also under customary law. So, and as well as the 1951 convention and customary law is also part of a, frame, a legal framework. So these are two tools a country in the situation of Trinidad and Tobago can make use. But also integration has to do as well with access to rights. So sometimes even if the legal framework is not complete, you can facilitate access to rights via policies of the institutions. And thirdly, um, integration. And integration is not just to do with the legal status, it has also to do with opportunities to find work and also to do with opportunities to integrate into the society. So to become friends with the neighbors, to have a support network. And all these three components, so uh, the legal framework, the access to rights and the integration, including financial and cultural, is what offers a protection environment for refugees and asylum seekers in a country. Thank you. Thank you. Leanne? Okay, thanks, Dr. McCree. In terms of the Global Compact for Migration, um, this framework, this is actually a global governance framework to assist with the coordination of international migration work. Um, I am pleased to indicate that the International Organization for Migration has assisted the Ministry of Planning, Trinidad and Tobago, with efforts towards a migration policy, and it has also assisted the Ministry of Labor, Trinidad and Tobago, with efforts towards a labor migration policy. However, the extent to which um, the DTM data is utilized in the creation of this policy is, of course, at the discre discretion and determination of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So I won't be able to speak to that bit. Thank you. Um, since you are still on the, I don't know what's the phrase, on the floor or? Spotlight. <laughs> Leanne, yes, I, there's one question here. Uh, I noted that you highlighted the marital status of respondents in your survey. Did you notice a trend re international marital relationships between citizens of Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago? Okay, um, the DTM did not capture that level of information. We looked solely at their marital status because something I should also note is that. And DTM is an international instrument that is conducted across a number of countries and regions. So the information captured is more or less standardized for each country implementing the instrument. And we didn't capture that type of information. Um, Dr. McCree, if you could also allow me, I saw another question which is closely related to the issue or the idea of anchor babies. And um, the DTM also did not capture that level of information in terms of persons um, having children in Trinidad as an option of or to uh, improve their chances 
of legitimizing their state. So we didn't capture that level of information. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question that just came into the chat for Maria Jose. In terms of brain waste on a national level, do you think one of the main reasons for this is the concern of repatriation of financial resources out of Trinidad to Venezuela or other home countries of migrants? In terms of brain waste on a national level, do you think one of the main reasons for this is the concern of repatriation of financial resources out of Trinidad to Venezuela or other home countries of migrants? Thank you, Dr. McCree, and thank you for the for the question. Um, now, just so that I that I'm understanding correctly, um, when, when we talk about brain waste as, as a whole, let's say in a country, brain waste of migrants, if we think of it as systematically, maybe as to why you know uh, immigrants are not being hired in their area of of um, of knowledge or skill that would be like a policy issue so it, in that sense we would have to ask ourselves if um if the possibility of immigrants uh, surrendering remittances abroad is a key reason as to why they are not granted status which in itself leads to them being de-skilled right uh, my, my, my research focus was specifically on the migrants experience themselves. And so I, we looked at mainly um, the employers, right? And so at the employer level, there's really not this worry about whether the migrants gonna use, um, repatriate financial resources somewhere else, send remittances somewhere else, right? That's really not a concern that the employer is having, whether the employer is, an employer that is hiring the person for their skill or not. Um, and at the government, larger government level, I, I still don't necessarily think that this is um, necessarily an issue or a concern in terms of repatriating money or, or financial resources. Um, immigrants in every space have shown to contribute to their local um, economy, whether it is through their own labor. So the impact that something, for instance, like remittances or uh, sending money abroad to families to other countries is not necessarily impactful enough to deter the possible benefit that a skilled migrant could have. Maria Jose, since you are in the spotlight, one question for you again. Mm -hmm. I noted the foregrounding of discrimination in your presentation. What mm -hmm. sensitization strategies do you think could be implemented to deal with this situation? So discrimination is so broad, right? And when we think of discrimination that these particular immigrants um, who are skilled are, are, are undergoing, is uh, discrimination at the institutional level. They're facing discrimination at the social level. They're facing discrimination even among other Venezuelan immigrants, right? As I mentioned. So discrimination really is kind of a, a cross cutting and there's certainly not like a one, uh, one goal type of strategy uh, that would uh, be um, feasible to sensitize everybody in regards to, to um, to how to better treat immigrants or how to not discriminate, right? At the government level, I certainly think that many of my colleagues who are working uh, partnership, uh, partnering with government entities, I feel like a lot of the work is very much based on, on sensitizing uh, government organizations and uh, institutions in regards to institutional uh, discrimination. Now, when it comes to the social uh, factors and especially discrimination in the labor market, that's a whole another beast, right? So something that's really important, I feel, is kind of to start with how immigrants are portrayed in the media, and that's really, really key. Um, and that's something that I know many journalists within Trinidad and Tobago have already been working on, um, but it's certainly not, um, not an easy road. Um, and besides the media, there's always sort of this personal sensitization that can happen when we as academics, when people who are working at non-government organizations are discussing immigrants and immigration, right? And, and open conversations regarding specifically how we can better treat each other. 
I, 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 like I said, I, I definitely don't think that there's a, a one go approach to sensitizing uh, the many facets, the many cross cutting facets that further uh, discrimination. But I think that at multiple levels, there are many ways that you know this can be approached. Thank you, Maria Jose. I will now ask another batch of three to four questions. Question to Ms. Ramdeen. What seems to be the major reason why the government of Trinidad and Tobago um, is refusing to provide for the inclusion of migrant children into the nation's schools? Second question, is it against the right of the child to deny access to education for children at detention facilities? Third question, what mechanisms can be implemented by public and private institutions to harness the skills of migrants? What mechanisms can be implemented by public and private institutions to harness the skills of migrants? And lastly, are there any legal institutions that provide support for migrants who are being exploited at their workplace? Are there any legal institutions or legal recourse that allow migrants to report exploitation at work? Okay, can, can I um, yes. uh, re respond to the question relating to uh, the reason why in fact um, there is I, I want to remind people that over two years ago, at an event marking International Men's Day hosted by the Bankers Association of Trinidad and Tobago, our Attorney General, Honorable Faris al Rawi, said, and I quote him, and this was in the media, Trinidad and Tobago cannot afford to put systems in place at this time to deal with refugees and asylum seekers. However, he has admitted it's an important discussion for Trinidad and Tobago to start having since taxpayers would be the ones to foot the bill eventually when such things are put in place. And he said um, statistics are needed to guide the policy. He's, and this is a quote from him as well. The current rate flow out of Trinidad and Tobago is approximately 20 to 40 per, people per year. So it means we're signing on as a country to engage in holding all of the people in our local pot with a rate flow out of 20 to 40 people per year. That is the dynamic that this country has to analyze to make sure we can actually afford to deal with that. And that is only one of the points. The other aspect is, well, he said, what other systems can we engage in? And in fact, there are protocols that we've engaged in right now in terms of access to healthcare, certain access to education, et cetera. So we're, we're working our way around the peripheries of it. We're in constant discussions with all of the entities. And of course, he, he said the maths is, as, are we prepared from a policy perspective to manage this perspective right now? Because once you turn the key, then you create rights and obligations which are actionable, and then you have to be prepared to operationalize that law. One cannot easily jump into a situation knowing that you can't oper oper operationalize it immediately. It has to be done in a phased perspective. This is not something that one engages in an ad hoc knee-jerk response. It has to be carefully considered, and that work is being done. That was more than two years ago. And the work, in fact, hasn't got to the stage where we still can cannot waive the need for these children to access what the prime minister said, Catholic Church wanted to let them into school, go ahead, and yet no waiver. So I don't know how what phase we're at yet, but these are the words of, so on the one hand, the prime minister said, Catholic Church, let them in your schools. On the other hand, the attorney general is saying, we have to do it on a phase basis. How long are we waiting for this phase basis to take effect? So I, I really feel that we have to look at um, what we can do, which is what TCS and AMMR are doing, online courses and what Living Water is doing, the, um, the, the, the online courses and, and in-person courses, because we can wait forever. These children are growing up in Trinidad and Tobago. They, they, whether they're citizens or not, or they have right, they are here. And I don't see them going anywhere. As far as detention um, is concerned, those in detention centers, 
I don't, those in detention centers, we have no access to them. So I don't think they get in any form of education. I may be wrong, but we're not involved in educating or giving support to, to those in detention centers. In terms of legal institutions that can provide support for those exploited, being exploited, what we've done on CCSJ and MMR, we've got, I told you, this national um, support system through WhatsApp. So that when people are Venezuelans know they're going for an interview for a job, some of our people go with them to make sure that from the start of initial, they're not, when they're told what, what wage they're going to get, it's not less than minimum wage and they're not being exploited. However, we know that once they start work, they can be exploited. And the sad thing is many of them, because remember the first tranche of people who were in, who were registered was 16,523. And we know they made, they, they, they're about 40 to 60,000 Venezuelans here, no accurate data. So 16,523 in 2019, and then the next tranche, 13,800. I don't know what happened to the rest, but 13,800 is not every, Venezuelan, which means that many of them are working without registration status. And that, that allows for exploitation. And the exploitation continues. Sorry, those are just Ms. some of the issues. Thank you, Ms. Ramdeen. Any other responses? There was also a question as to how can we harness the skills of migrants? And I suppose um, experience brain gain instead of brain waste. How can we harness the skills of migrants, the same problematic for the, the Trinidad and Tobago diaspora. How can we harness their skills, their education, their training? So, can I, can I just, sorry, I just wanted to add in one, one thing, because as I told you, one of the people who was helping us and still help us is um, a, a mad, former magistrate. On our team, Ambrosio is a lawyer from Venezuela. He cannot he cannot practice here. He cannot, you know, some of them are one really skilled person who's working in a warehouse, in a hardware, a qualified, highly qualified person. So the sad thing is we can't, they cannot practice even if they have a registration card because they're not qualified here. But we can harness their skills in other ways. And this is what we need to try to do. Thank you. Any other responses from the panelists? Uh, yeah, I would like to address that specific question about um, harnessing the skills of, um, of migrants, which also relates to mechanisms that uh, can be implemented by the public and, and private institutions and private sector, uh, which was a, a previous question that you had mentioned, uh, Professor McCree. So um, this is really interesting, you know, the the reality that we know of many people who are professional, right? And uh, when we when we think of them as, as having skills, their ability to work in their own areas is harnessing their skills, right? So um, it's it's not necessarily a matter of making them do something else because even though they would of course be able to excel at that, um, the the key notion of not de-skilling and making use of their skill and and, and professional background is that they are able to to participate uh, within their areas of expertise. So key things that uh, other countries have done specifically in, in relation to Venezuelan immigrants, but also in relation to South-South migration movements have been um, employment type of visas that are very specific to uh, persons with a certain level of skill. Now, this has been actually highly beneficial in some countries who ha that have um, integrated a lot of uh, foreign trained doctors so this has happened, for instance, in Ecuador and in Peru, where they have taken in Venezuelan doctors, Venezuelan trained doctors, uh, who through their own minister, ministries of health have undergone some sort of local training to adapt to the local context and have been huge assets during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And being able to obtain a work visa that allows them to live in a country legally and at the same time work in their profession and contribute to the country. So uh, one, one key thing would be like a work visa based on skills. And another key important thing too, for at least in terms of public entities is really um, the, the, the immigrants ability to get their, um, 
their, prof their professionalization degree document uh, accepted within the Trinidadian system. Um, of course, when we discuss uh, lawyers, when we discuss doctors, many professions do have, um, do have, you know, to be adapted to a certain local context. And so it would be up to the local institution, the public institution to make way for that. But it is really key for immigrants to not only be able to, to work based on their uh, profession, but also to, for their degrees to be counted, especially from international universities that, that, that are not within the Caribbean. And now for, for the private institutions, private institutions sometimes are really kind of like, like I said, a chicken and the egg. They may sometimes even be willing to hire people, but they don't necessarily know how to, right? The, the immigration process in Trinidad and Tobago and having <laughs> live there myself, I can totally say that is really quite confusing. There's not, for instance, like a place of centralized information where everybody can know where, how to proceed if I need to do this. If I need to uh, be a worker, I need these documents, right? And not everything is centralized and a lot of times is really unclear. And private companies know this, right? And so uh, what would be really important for the private sector would not only be to be willing to open up um, a lot of positions to immigrants, but to know how to be able to deal with that specific labor force so they can appropriately sponsor them. Thank you, um, Maria. Any other responses to yeah. questions related uh, to protection, well, education, exploitation? Yeah, uh, I think I could just weigh in a little bit on looking at the flip side of the coin, which is looking at how we can harness the skills of the diaspora. I think uh, an important exercise that the policy will allow for is first of all, to map the skills because we don't even know where everyone is geographically located. We know we have a very diverse skilled population. And the first exercise would be to have a, a proper mapping so that we would know uh, what the skill sets are, what the career history is like, et cetera. So that would allow us to target specific areas of expertise that we be lacking here and allow for cross collaborations, right? With NGOs, with the private sector, with multiple groups, with state agencies, with individuals. Um, secondly, um, it has happened in the past that Diaspora individuals with very much needed skill sets have served in an advisory uh, capacity on boards and so on, or have been on committees. It's not a very um, frequent thing, but it has happened before. For example, in the preparation of reports on the safety and the integrity of the Port of Spain General Hospital, it included, the team included people who are doctors who are based abroad. So it has been done before, but the diaspora policy does allow for more of this kind of uh, collaboration where there are joint technical councils in specific areas, whether it's mental health, community development, tourism, with professionals who have a vested interest in Trinidad and Tobago, but who already practice in their respective areas wherever. So that's one way of being able to better harness some of those skills. Can you shed some more light on the home associations? We have those in Trinidad where, which communities, North, South, Central, Tobago? They're based all over. Now the home associations are not based in Trinidad. Hometown associations are based on the diaspora and they are created based on that um, affinity with a particular community or town or village. And so um, I met people who are based in Washington or New York, but they are originally from Tokyo. So they have workshops that target, let's say young people, or it may be in the area of sport development, or it may be in the area of giving scholarships. Um, so that's the kind of thing that people do. One person in New York, he belongs to an umbrella organization um, that is quite established in New York. And he's originally from Lavender, so he offers scholarships to young men in Lavender. 
So there are many, many examples, but it's not something that is very, um, that is very known. And the average citizen would not be aware of some of these initiatives. So when the diaspora policy is, when it, when it is actually aired and there's a virtual town meeting so that both people in the homeland here in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as people overseas can get by in, this is where people will be able to give their input. So there'll be the final leg in terms of final after, finalizing the draft. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. I um, just want, if there are no more responses, allow me to read two more questions. Um, one, again, for Leanne. Um, do you think any of the increase in dependence in Trinidad and Tobago have been in an effort to have an anchor baby? I don't know what an anchor baby means, but um, is this increase in dependence associated with some desire or <laughs> the phenomena of the anchor baby in Trinidad and Tobago. That's um, first question. Second one from Glennis, migrants who are not charged on our immigration laws or based on our immigration laws, but are either held at facilities or repatriated, are their rights being infringed? Migrants who are not charged based on our immigration laws, but are either held at facilities or repatriated, are their rights being infringed? Okay, so um, thanks Dr. McCree and thanks for your question. Um, in terms of the anchor babies, I, I know that I may have alluded to this before in terms of the DTM did not look at the reason for the um, pregnancy or, or um, births amongst the migrant population. But um, in terms of the dependence and the shift in the number of dependents in Trinidad and Tobago, what we were able to deduce from our stakeholder interviews was that um, there was a gradual shift towards familial reunification. So as more migrants came in, um, we saw amongst our stakeholders, they noted that um, one person of a family may come in and then they may um, seek to have the remainder of their family join them in Trinidad and Tobago. And that may account for the trend that we saw or the shift from the majority of dependents being in Trinidad, being in um, their home country, Venezuela, and then moving towards Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela. And we need to be clear with that distinction because it's not that they're only my um, dependence in Trinidad and Tobago alone, but it's Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela. So that's as much as I can say with regard to the anchor baby idea. Um, the second question was looking, if you could just remind me, Dr. McCree, it was looking Let me, let me at, pick it up here. Um, this now. Questions are coming in on the chat and on my cell phone. Um, whilst you look for it, I can also, uh, um, I'd also like to interject regarding the legal institution um, with the remit for any cases of exploitation. And based on IOM's work with the Ministry of Labor, um, we note that the Ministry of Labor has a facility in place for migrants to report any instances of exploitation or abuse. I also recognize Leela's comment in terms of migrants being apprehensive to do so for fear of deportation. But um, based on our information um, at the IOM, I think that the Ministry of Labor addresses concerns of all migrant workers, um, irregardless of their migrant status. So just wanted to highlight that. And I think um, that may be an avenue for more public um, awareness in terms of the avenues available to migrants to report any incidents of exploitation, abuse, or any concerns that they may have. Okay, the question was, migrants who are not charged based on our immigration laws, but are either held at facilities or repatriated, are their rights being infringed? Okay, so that one, I'm not of the parameters because um, in terms of the 
extension, there may there would be some just cause under our laws for detention of persons, be it irregular entry as it pertains to our immigration laws or whatever other circumstances. However, um, in the case of repatriations, there are voluntary and involuntary repatriations. And once again, um, I am not aware based on my exposure of any um, migrants being held who have not committed any um, immigration infractions or legal infractions as it pertains to the wider national laws of Trinidad and Tobago. So I can only speak from my perspective um, with regard to those issues. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, one other question that these particularly with the issue of health um, regarding communicable disease surveillance. Is it possible to have more coordinated SOPs between the Ministry of Health, NGOs, and uh, CSOs to better cover early detection and response to possible disease outbreaks? Noting the WSH wash issues many migrants face and the close living conditions they reside in. Is it possible, they, they use some acronyms here I'm not familiar with, some of you, you know, in, in the community may be familiar with SOPs, um, but the issue has to do with um, containing and dealing with the, um, the existence and spread of communicable disease among immigrants who live in very close, you know, spaces or living conditions. Is it possible to have mechanisms to facilitate early detection? Ms. Ms. Ramdeen? Yeah, can I, can I just say that we, we're working with the parish ministries on the ground. And that is important because you will recall there was a time when um, it was stated by a minister that you could go to jail if you're harboring them. I remember that was the height of COVID. And a lot, we face a backlash from the mi migrant community because many landlords who were fearful that they would be jailed put out the migrants on the streets. And so whether some, whether they were there legally or, or didn't have their registration papers, we made it worse by having them on the street, just expelling them from homes. And so where did they go? As we know, as, as, as was reported in the media, Many went on the beaches, in the forests, because they had nowhere to stay. So if, you, if we're trying to track communicable diseases, they're real issues. First of all, there's a fear, as I just put in the chat. People are afraid to be deported. So even if they have, the government says, if you have TB, COVID, um, HIV, AIDS, come forward and you'll, be, you'll receive free treatment, although it's not primary care, you'll receive... People are afraid because of xenophobia and they're afraid that they'll be deported. And I don't know of any group that's going around. I mean, when we give support, either through our, our hampers, et cetera, the parish ministries collect data. We have sent a central database. We collect data. If there are issues, health issues, we try to help. As I said, we now have a, a health fairs that we run across the country. We have doctors, Spanish speaking doctors who give up their services free of charge. And we are collecting information and we're hoping that we're creating such a, a positive environment that if they do have communicable diseases, they will share that information when they come to our health fairs. The last health fair had you know, over 600 people and migrants and TT citizens come. So I think that's what we have to develop, positive environment in which people will not be afraid to say what they have. Thank but you very much. No I have something to this that I feel yes. is really, really important and really interesting, mainly also based on um, the, the interviews that I conducted and on the experience of immigrants. And it, it sometimes, government entities can can claim to be very open uh, regardless of your status but somebody who is constantly being told 
uh, being threatened with deportation, maybe not from a government entity, but maybe from some uh, from a person who is telling them, if you don't do this, I'll report you, um, who, who is being kicked out of their home, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter how protected they may be from deportation, uh, they still are not going to be likely to come forward. So uh, I'm just going to throw this out because this is really important. And some countries in the Latin American region have done this, is that uh, government entities have partnered with organizations, for instance, like Catholic Charities, um, that provide a little bit of a buffer between the immigrant and the government organization where the immigrant feels more comfortable coming forward and asking for help, not only in regards to healthcare and healthcare needs during COVID, but also in regards to reporting possible abuse issues uh, at work or in their environment. So that then the, the organization goes to the government with anonymity, protecting the anonymity of the immigrant if possible um, so that these issues can be relayed and the government entity is aware of them and can solve them if possible. Um, now, I, I understand this creates a certain level of bureaucracy and more time and more money and more issues, but it has been in many countries a, an effective way at least to um, get government organizations to really understand some of the hardships that people are going through that they're not necessarily going to be willing to personally um, acclaim themselves to a government organization. And I think that's really important. Okay, thank you, um, Maria. Can, um, I, can I just add to this, sorry, that in fact, um, organizations on this panel, they work with us, IOM, UNHCR, at our health fairs, and in fact, as we move forward with the new um, three-year agreement with UNICEF, we're going to be having roaming health fairs as well, further roaming health fairs. And over the last few, we found a lot of the international organizations have continue to partner with us at these health fairs. So they're different booths, and that's the way to go. So as, as was just said, people will then become comfortable and want to speak speak out about exploitation, about their health care needs, et cetera. We have to create that environment where people will feel, well, okay, we're not going to be deported. Somebody's going to listen to us. Somebody's going to take action. That's what we need to do. And we cannot do it alone. And, and collaboration, as I say, with local and international organizations is the way to go. Thank you, Ms. Ram Ramdeen. I would now like to invite final comments as we bring this um, very important discussion to a close, final comments from the panelists on the way forward in, in dealing with this pressing uh, concern. One minute, okay, if, I could, <laughs> if I could interject, um, Dr. McCree, I would yes. say definitely um, the policy that need to be implemented, primarily the migration policy and the labor migration policy. I think that those are integral to any structured and systematic approach to dealing with the migration situation. Of course, I understand within the context of COVID-19, um, the pandemic, we have had some uncharted waters that we have entered and it has um, derailed some of the efforts that you know, we're in the pipeline, so I recognize that, but um, I think that starting with a policy that adds direction, focus, and, you know, provides clear ideas in terms of the national intentions and objectives, I think that would very much add um, a lot of insight into the migration situation, as well as help with my effective migration management. Thank you. Thank you. As, as you all, um... Uh, prepare final um, comments, question just came in. Um, what can be done to ensure the protection of Venezuelan indigenous groups in Trinidad and Tobago? Someone is reporting the existence of Venezuelan indigenous groups in San Fernando, such as the Wara Warahu indigenous group. And it's in that context, the question is being asked. So it's something to think about. Um, if you have a response, you can provide. Otherwise, you could you know, give your 
your final comments. Okay. Amanda? Yes, so I will respond in the best way I can and then I'll give my final remark. Uh, so um, yes, thank you for acknowledging that there are Warao indigenous from Venezuela living in Trinidad and Tobago. And we don't have enough time now, but I just want to mention that last year we conducted a participatory assessment with the support also of IOM and the NGO Helping Hearts and Living Water Community with them uh, where they had the opportunity to express what are the main problems that are affecting them as well as to propose solutions to these problems and they are quite there are eight in total so i won't go into detail but just to say that that document is available in the r4b platform and uh there are there is the way forward you know is their own the, is themselves the what I was saying what is affecting them and how to where they want the solutions so I would recommend that to read the document and start there as a starting but not ending point and in a more general terms to give my final remarks of course I want to thank you for the invitation it has been an honor to share this discussion also with the other panelists who have made an excellent job and I want to say that we will continue as UNHCR to encourage the country and, and provide our support in developing the national legal framework, in expanding the registration exercise, not just to other Venezuelans, but also to other nationalities, and to continue support the access to education for uh, children and adults uh, who are asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants, as well as to promote access to other services. So thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Anyone else? Uh, last um, comments? We can go. Move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCree. I, I would also like to like to thank uh, uh, Salisis and Yui and everyone uh, for the opportunity to be here and, and share our, our thoughts. I'm also extremely proud to participate on a discussion on immigration with an all-female panel, which has been really an honor for me. Um, and uh, in regards specifically to um, my research and um, the discussion that I uh, kind of led today, I, I really feel, um, as, as many of my other colleagues uh, discussed, the, the legal framework is, is really important. It's really import is important because it provides pathways for people to immigrate not only as refugees or asylees, but also as professional workers. And this is key not only legally, but also when it comes to the development um, of the country, right? If we are talking about international development, it's really key that we make use of the human capital that is available to us. And so it's really strategic moving forward for, um, for, for us to start looking at how we can further policies, maybe do some comparative analysis with other countries that have implemented uh, policies that have furthered the ability of professional uh, immigrants to um, be able to participate in the local labor force. And, um, and for the private sector to really get involved and um, be willing to hire these individuals. And so that's, that's really, really important, as well as the continued studies. Um, and I really commend uh, my, my colleagues who I know are conducting research, uh, both qualitative and quantitative, because the data is really, really important for us to be able to understand what's happening and how we can best move forward. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Maria. Anyone else? Uh, uh, can I can I go? I want to just say that we know that migrants and refugees and asylum seekers, their human rights, all their human rights should be protected and promoted. I want to also pay tribute to the kindness and generosity of the many Trinidadians and Tobagonians who have warmly welcomed migrants to our home. So while we're talking about the need for a legislative framework and, and also for policies that will work for the migrants and refugees, let us not forget the thousands of Trinis and Tobagonian TD citizens who continue to support and the international and local organizations like, like a CETA, IOM, UNHCR, etc., who continue to support us 
here, our local people, as well as um, those who have come to our show. They're not only the Venezuelan, as we heard, over 40 different nationalities who, who've come to our shows. So I want us to work hard together to pray. Pray is important, as Eduardo said, don't forget their spiritual needs as well. And many of them are from Christian community. So let's reach out. Let's reach out also to our politicians. We put our politicians there, and no matter how small the cake is, I feel there's enough room for all God's children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rambin. I think that's it. I want to personally thank all the panelists. I want to share a comment by Karina Sindhill, thank, thanking the presenters, saying you all did an exceptional job of representing your research and your services. And I, I was privileged to have the opportunity to, to be a part of this forum and to facilitate your, your views and your discussion. I, I thank you um, immensely. Um, unfortunately, I have a, another meeting, pressing meeting at 1 p.m. Um, as I hand over to my, my colleague, Dr. Priya Mohan, I just would like her to know that um, I have to rush off to a meeting uh, for 1 p.m. I have to travel to get there. Um, so, but thanks again and um, have a pleasant day and uh, productive rest of the year. Thank you very much. I now hand you over to my colleague, I'm Dr. Priya Mohan, to give the vote of thanks. Priya? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. St. Bernard. Um, so my job is a very simple but very important one. I am Priya Mohan, Senior Fellow at Solisis. Um, I do hope that everyone enjoyed this very informative forum organized by Solisis today. It is my honor and privilege now to give thanks to all of those who made this forum happen. And firstly, of course, I'd like to begin by thanking all our panelists. The presentations were very well researched and very underground, very practical. The presentations also show that there is a lot of good work out there taking place in the country, and that was really positive to hear. I would also like to thank the UV Marketing and Communications team, especially Josanne, who's always here with us for all our events. Also, our Solicis administrative staff, Katian, Francine, and Ephraim, they are in the background making it all happen. I'd also like to thank our chairperson, Dr. Roy McCree, who always does a very excellent job. Also to our acting director, Dr. Godfrey St. Bernard, for his leadership and vision in bringing together these events. And lastly, of course, to our audience, thank you very much for your attention and, and interaction and posing all those very important questions. We do look forward to seeing you at our next event. Um, I think I would bring it to a close unless uh, Dr. St. Bernard has any final words because I think Dr. Uh, McCree has left. Yes. Um... I will, I shall um, just use some final words. Um, first of all, I do want to express my sincerest thanks to everyone who made this event possible today. And I concur with the sentiments expressed by my colleague, Dr. Priya Mohan in her vote of thanks. I must say that, you know, this was yet another um, heartening display of Salisis's contribution to development process in Trinidad and Tobago and indeed the Caribbean. And I want to thank all of the presenters who have presented in all of our forums thus far, and especially those who presented in today's um, forum. Specifically, I want to um, first of all, thank those who graciously um, agreed to participate upon our request. I'm talking specifically about uh, Ms. Giselle Chance, Ms. Leela Ramdeen, and Ms. Amanda Solano. I, I, and I call these people because really and truly, I, I did not know them well. I, I, I recognize the names, but they, they are really persons who I have heard about and I'm really happy that they have graciously agreed to bring their respective perspectives to bear upon the excellent display of discourses we had in today's 
session. So I want to specifically thank these three women, first of all. I also want to say a special thanks to my two colleagues, Ms. Leanne waldrop Bonnier and Dr. Michelle Rees, who both of whom I've known for many years, more than 10 years, and I know their commitment and dedication to issues akin to international migration, and we are very delighted to have had them join this esteemed panel and make their respective um, contributions. And finally, of course, um, to Ms. Maria Jose Flor Agreda, I want to thank her in particular, especially since she has been a product of um, Salisis, graduating from our MSc Development Statistics Program and has always been an exemplary student establishing um, tremendous potential to develop into an outstanding scholar with formidable insights and I want to especially thank as well Maria for her, 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 her contribution in today's proceedings. All in all, we have had a fine display of scholarship and expertise in terms of understanding and unraveling some of the critical issues that play out in international migration, specifically with respect to um, the various emerging um, subpopulations and that is specifically placed in the title because I would imagine as time rolls on, these subpopulations may change in form and, 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 and numbers and we need to understand them because one thing for sure, migration and international migration is here to stay and it will be one of the critical levers that we really have to um, adjust and, and, and make pronouncements and prescriptions about as time um, moves on. Specifically, a lot of um, references were made to legislative um, agendas and legislative amendments that would impact the process in terms of grappling with the rights associated with internal, um, international migration. Also, I want to um, really make a statement in terms of um, the the, 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 fin the, the the final part of the title in terms of you know maximizing benefits, minimizing threats to national development. I think everything that is that was said here today uh, does contribute in many ways um, to how we begin to treat with rights and how legislative agendas may contribute to that by virtue of the evidence that we have brought to the fore in today's presentation. So I think, you know, all in all, it was a really um, worthy treat that everyone who witnessed it today can say, you know, yes, we, we had a, a, a feast of, in terms of the knowledge and the information that was shared. In closing, I just want to make a few statements about upcoming Salises events. In a month's time, we will have another um, another forum. This forum will specifically, we are thinking of looking at the whole carnival experience. And we are looking at the Friday that is normally dubbed Fantastic Friday for hosting this event. But we think, you know, we have to have a discussion on that. That's one of the things we are, we are targeting. In, um, but even sooner than that, I want to bring your attention, Salises as a development studies institute also caters to a, a wide range of stakeholders. And next week, Friday, insofar as next week will be Sir Arthur Lewis week, Sir Arthur Lewis week, because we normally on an annual basis celebrate the birthday of Sir Arthur. schools to present um, peep, um, to make presentations on the life and works of Sir Arthur Lewis. So I'm announcing this because everyone will be invited to it. And we have asked four specialists in development studies to make commentaries on the students' work and to, of course, express their own thoughts on the life and work of Sir Arthur Lewis. So next week, you can look out for that next Friday. Um, we will send out the links and so on, so those who are interested can join. 
And the following Monday, the Salesis academics will be presenting their research. And again, we will send that out to you. When I say the Salesis academics, it will be a big treat because it's not only Salesis St. Augustine, it will also be the academics of Salesis Cable and Salesis Mona who will be presenting their works and the works that they do that are relevant to development studies and akin to the thematic issues that were central to the life and work of Sir Arthur Lewis, whose name the Institute carries. So having said that, my special thanks to all of you for having graced us with your presence today. We look forward to continued collaboration and working with you on a number of other projects and assignments. And at this point, all I can do is wish you a very um, enjoyable rest of the day. Enjoy your weekend. And most of all, free yourselves and be safe and keep safe as we engage and, 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 and counteract you know, the ravages of COVID-19 and its um, variants. So thank you very much and have a good day. And thanks for your attendance in this um, virtual forum. It's my pleasure and Salises's pleasure to have had you. Thank you very much. Thank you.